Hello everyone and welcome to Can Do Event 2, the live event. This is part of our Making the Most of Now series. Hopefully some of you have caught our um, first one in the series, which was on last week, and you can find that on our Facebook page, the Can Do Facebook page, if you're looking to watch that again, that was really good. Um, I was on there last week as one of the panel, and I'm on again this week as a kind of chair host for this one. Um, and you may have noticed I've tried to make myself look far less scruffy last, than I was last week. So I've had a bit of a shave and I'm trying to put a shirt on. So hopefully that's an improvement. I kept looking at myself on the screen and thinking I look really scruffy. So um, this event, which is going to be about um, getting the most of home life. So uh, in this event, we're going to be talking about um, we're getting the most of accessible accommodation and moving around and socialising in our own homes. Um, There'll also be a question and answer at the end. Um, so if you've got any questions, go onto the Facebook page, put them in the comments, and hopefully we can address some of those at the end. There will be a practical session towards the end with um, Jack showing us some uh, ways to keep our wheelchairs or our mobility equipment maintained and uh, up to working standard. So the best way to start is by saying, uh, my name's Rob Smith, I work from Active Hands. Uh, we're part of the Candy Group, and we'll go around and do a small introduction, a few minutes from everyone in the group, please. So let's start off with Guy, because on my screen, you're to my right. Great. Thanks, Rob. Hello, everyone. I'm Guy Harris. I run Accessible PRS, which is a property consultancy specializing in accessible strategy and design. And that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, I'm, I'm really I'm motivated to increase the supply of accessible homes that people can rent, that wheelchair users can rent. So my interest, I'm uh, a, a paraplegic, so full-time wheelchair user since 2003 uh, when I was hit by a lorry. And um, there are two parts, two sides of the business, really. One is to work with landlords and investors and, and to get them to understand why accessible housing is relevant and, and you know, good news for them. Uh, and then to match uh, tenants to their properties. So we have a, a, a list or a database um, People can register with us and then we will help find you uh, your next accessible home. Um, and the other side is consultancy. So I work with um, co-housing groups, developers, architects, uh, self-builders, just to help them layer in um, better accessibility, um, understand how people might experience uh, the designs they're, they're hoping to implement. And um, uh, yeah, that's me. That's Guy Harris. Yeah, and we'll move on to Emma from Disability Horizons. Hi, so I'm Emma. I'm from Disability Horizons. I've been writing with the online magazine for the past eight years. I started out as a like community writer while I was studying my A-levels and my degree. And then now I've moved on to become news editor and feature writer. So I write regular news content to do anything to do with disability, with technology, politics, health and entertainment and then also I do a lot of interviews with quite well-known people with like most recently I've done Adi Dipitan, Alex Brooker, Kerry Bennell and all sorts of other people and on top of that I also run my own blog called Rock for Disability which has disability and living content and music content. Thank you Emma and uh, on my screen at least Gary is next. I'm Gary Cooper and I run Judy Cooper Architectural Services. I um, also had a, an accident back in 2003, left me paralysed. Um, I then went on to, to retrain, I went to university, got a first class degree in architectural technology um, and started my own business, uh, utilising a, a lifetime's worth of experience working in the building industry. Since then, I've, um, I've expanded to combine uh, my practical experience in the building trade, my professional qualifications, and my uh, hands-on everyday experience as a wheelchair user um, to provide a specialist service for disabled and elderly clients. Okay, thank you, Gary. And Jack? Hi, I'm Jack from uh, Jack's Mobility Solutions. Um, I'm one of the numpties that uh, broke his neck uh, doing something dangerous. So I had a kite surfing accident uh, back in 2012. Um, from then, I uh, decided to kind of uh, open up my own uh, mobile repair business 
um, catering for um, manual chair users and power assist products. Um, so using my uh, my uh, my my previous experience from the mechanical trade and from the the actual mobility trade itself. Um, yeah, I, uh, I offer a, a, a kind of reliable um, and affordable service for uh, manual wheelchair users. Thank you. And Duncan? I'm uh, Duncan Edwards. I'm from Traversack. Um, I got married uh, 20 years ago to Claire, who's a wheelchair user. And about 10 years ago, she invented a bag that you can carry and use as a tray. So. Um, we've been selling it for about 10 years, meeting lots of people in the trade, entrepreneurs uh, of all types. And um, recently, in the last year, I've helped uh, Disability Horizons set up a shop and we're selling lots of um, new products on there that help people in their daily lives. Thank you. And uh, as you can hear from Duncan, we do work together as a number of companies. So we're kind of a loosely based collective. We haven't got any sort of structure. But as a candy group, um, we're all represented over these last these three um, events. So there were some of us on the first one, uh, a large number of us here, and then there's a few more will be represented in the last event, which will be next week at five o'clock. So uh, we're going to kind of split this uh, discussion today into two halves, really. So the first half is mostly going to be about housing accommodation and how we fit into that. Um, so I'm just going to sort of kick it off with a question which is uh, what are the benefits of a correctly designed accessible home and what are our own personal experiences or um, professional experiences of that? Um, and how can it benefit our mental health, um, the way that we can move around our homes in harmony rather than the frustrations of uh, houses not working well for our disabilities? And I'll throw that open to anyone. Does anyone want to go first? Yeah, I could, I could start off with that. Um, fun fundamentally, a well-designed home would leave uh, somebody that's disabled being able to live a life um, as a non-disabled person. Uh, I know that myself personally, I can pull up on the drive, get out of my car, which has hand controls. I can wheel straight in my front door, which has level access. Um, I've designed in such a way there's no ramps or handrails, um, so it wouldn't look any different to anybody else's home. Um, once I'm inside, the doors are wide enough I don't have to slow down and squeeze through openings. I, um, I've also designed it to have an open plan, uh, kitchen, living, seating area, which, um, which is very popular with my uh, disabled or, or non-disabled clients. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have enough space to uh, have a kitchen where there, was, there are no wall units, so everything's accessible. Um, I, <clears throat> I wake up in the morning, I will into a, an ensuite bathroom with a fold down, shower chair. So um, there is nothing about my daily life that I can't do independently. And that's all, that's all, um, that's all because of the way my home's designed, because of the equipment that I use and, um, and the techniques that I've learned over the years. Back in 2003, when I first had my accident, I needed assistance to, um, to sit up let alone get dressed, wash, um, and everything else. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's one's environment that leaves somebody feeling disabled, not necessarily their, um, their, their accident. This is my personal experience. Um, yeah, pass that yeah, on to to else. To Totally agree with that. It's, it's that thing of opportunity and inclusion and joy. Um, <clears throat> I think back to our last home, um, we had a bathroom upstairs and the kids were, you know, babies at that point. So and our bath time was one of those events that I missed out on. Um, but now, you know, it's uh, it, having access all areas means that I can be part of everyday life. And I think that 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 thing of opportunity, if you can't access uh, areas, if you can't wash yourself, if you can't cook, um, you know, and be included, then... Um, it, it can impact on mental health. It can impact on ability to go out and get work. It can impact on relationships, all the fundamental parts of life. Um, you know, shelter is that is, is one of our most basic needs and uh, giving people that sort of autonomy to, to live their own lives and live their best lives is just, is, is really important. 
We, I mean, we did used to live in a, when I first met Claire, we had a, we, we bought a new home in Great Yarmouth and um, we put a three, four floor lift in and adapted it. Um, but the lift never really worked properly and it used to make a lot of noise in the night. Um, and um, now we're back at the house, um, at, the bung at a bungalow and but there's just not enough bungalows really in the country to go around. Um, but it's it is very, very handy to live in a bungalow. Were you not, was that, um, that lift not working properly? Um, did the company never sort it out for you? It just used to um, sort of settle in the night and make lots of noises, odd noises, and it often went wrong. Um, they're probably better, better now, you know, but um, we did have a few problems with it. Gary, you'll probably have something to say on this, but I, I always think one of the issues with um, the through floor lifts is is when people are laying out houses or planning houses that there, there's never somewhere easy for it to go or, or suitable for it to go. So, uh, you know, it's trying to avoid lifts just popping up in and out of bedrooms and sitting rooms. Uh, it's trying to think about the layout in advance so that uh, whatever future needs may be, um, we, we can we can incorporate ways and means of getting everyone everywhere. Yeah, thinking of access from from the very start of, a, of the design process is is key, rather than having things bolted on, add-ons. Um, we do have a, an aging population, and uh, if we, although <clears throat> many people would think that these these issues that, that we're talking about, of access, et cetera, will, will not affect them, will, ne will never affect them. Um, I have elderly clients as well as disabled clients that have uh, issues with, with access. And I have had clients that now do have the foresight to, um, to think uh, that they're gonna need these things um, because they, they want their home to be their forever home uh, rather than um, have to sell up and find something that more appropriate later on down the line. I think um, it's interesting for me to come in here because actually Gary has just done some designs for me for um, a potential extension um, to my house because uh, it's a two-story house. Um, I'm uh, in complete spinal cord injury and I managed to just about get up and down the stairs at the moment, but um, we're not quite sure how long that's gonna carry on for. So there's, um, potential for either a sort of stair lift or a three floor lift um, and like we're, we're going to come on to in a second question but I think we can address it now a bit that um, the sort of future proofing of your home is really important um, in a way that you can sort of potentially see where the problems might occur as you as your condition either deteriorates or you get older or as life changes regarding you know families and or getting older and that kind of thing so yeah, that's quite a, a key area to be thinking about um, accommodation-wise. Yeah, funnily enough, that, that thing of not thinking about future needs is so common. And, and when I'm speaking to people about why it's relevant, uh, there's, I, I often have that eureka moment when you know, I can see it landing, when, when people understand actually, if, if, for example, we're building a forever home and we want to die in a home, that, that, can, that can actually mean thinking through you know, how a hospital bed might come and join people in the sitting room or you know how we can get a wheelchair easily outside or how we can uh wash with you know a care assistant um and and i and people just don't have that understanding of 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 what it what actually might be the needs um you know for, for that inclusion and and it's just translating that into and making it relevant to people's lives and if we haven't sorted out our accommodation uh before we need it then when we need it is is you know quite often too late and and the impacts of that are huge so i know of a couple uh who just reached retirement age and kids are left home everything was looking good you know they got money in the bank <clears throat> they'd built their you know they self-built their own um forever home uh, unfortunately he had a stroke uh, three or four years later and you know their home wasn't set up you know that it, it just it hadn't been designed with future needs so after uh, you know it was an emotionally traumatic time anyway and they had to they ended up after some stress finding somewhere which they really didn't like but it just somewhere that that worked and 
it kind of felt like a, a totally avoidable situation. Um, well, it's hard because people have a blind spot. They've, many of us know older people who who sort of end up sort of staying downstairs all the time, and you don't quite sort of tackle them over it. But then you suddenly think, actually, they're not going upstairs at all. They're, they're sort of sleeping in a chair and things. I mean, look, I'm sure we've all had experiences like that with older relatives. Yeah. I'm just going to ask Emma as well, because I don't know her situation particularly. I know some of us have been talking from the point of view of our own homes, uh, you know, that we've got mortgages on, I presume, and can kind of do what we want with, but um, not everyone is in that situation. Yeah. I mean, I'm in housing association, so yeah. Hampshire County Council managed to fund all the sort of big jobs. So, like, I've got a wet room, I've got a ceiling hoist, I've got the bedroom door, the lounge door, and the kitchen door widened. They put like a little little corner table in the kitchen so I could sit there and help with cooking and baking and things. But, you know, but there is still limitations to what we can do. Like we can't build anything new. I mean, luckily it's all on one floor. I'm in like a mess in it. So I live in one sort of flat and I've got a neighbour living upstairs. So everything is downstairs. So that's fine. And luckily the front of the house was already quite accessible because I think there was an old man in a wheelchair that used to live here. So that bit was all a bit adapted for him already. And then they just put in like a back door ramp so I could go into the garden. So all the kind of big things have been put in for me, luckily. But if I wanted any more rooms or a bigger room or things like that, it just, it wouldn't be allowed because obviously I don't own this property. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, because of my personal circumstances, we are cons I am considering moving back in with my parents and they're going to look for like a good sort of forever home for them to retire because my dad's coming at sort of retirement age. This is all like a retirement home almost for mum and dad for their needs, but also will have my needs in mind as well. So that's kind of our sort of long-term goal, I think, for the future. What, what was, can I ask Emma, what your experience was, uh, you know, in the lead up to getting your home suitable it was, for you? It was slow. I mean, I was, um, basically I was at university and then I was, I don't know if you've heard of Trelaw College yeah. in Alton, it's like a disabled um, school college. So I was still living there while I was looking for somewhere. And eventually I managed to bid on this place in the process. They still had to do some, well, they had to do some jobs before I moved in, but they also had the rule that I had to be in the property to do other jobs. So they did the widening of the doors while I was still in my other house. But then they couldn't do any other jobs until I was living there. So I basically moved in with no furniture, no carpets or anything. And things like the bathroom, I couldn't really use at all. So I was basically driving to a care home once a week for a shower. And then just using the commode in my bedroom, the toileting, for about eight weeks. And then unfortunately the kitchen took about six months altogether to widen the door and get this extra bit table put in. So I didn't really have any access to the kitchen. So it was just a case of my carers doing all the cooking and cleaning. And I was sort of hovering in the hallway and directing them what to do basically. So it was quite a long process. So I think it took about a year altogether to get everything sorted. Yeah, that's oh, definitely that's a... yeah. I expect that's yeah. the um, experience of a lot of people who aren't fortunate enough to sort of, you know, to be in housing of, that they can't sort of change themselves or haven't, can't afford to change themselves. Jack, have you got anything to, um, to add? Uh, to be nice? So I, um, I rent privately. Um, and basically since coming out of hospital, I have just um, tried to source or find um, the most recent kind of new build flats to accommodate myself. Um, so I don't have like a, a wet room. Um, I've used, bits and pieces that you can buy from various mobility shops to kind of like accommodate um yeah to accommodate kind of bathing and showering and all that kind of stuff um i'm fortunate to have like uh gorilla arms so i can reach stuff from like a distance um my kitchen is is an open plan kind of kitchen which i'm currently in um but um yeah no so it hasn't been fun um i just kind of had to learn to kind of get around bits and pieces to kind of make my living as uh, as uh, yeah as, as good as possible really. 
What, what would in an ideal world? How long did it take you to find that place? And, and did, um, you, did you have barriers on the way? Um, yeah, no. I mean, my first, my first, the first, um, the first flat in Bognor um, was uh, that it had a lift. Um, when I viewed it, I was in uh, a loan chair from Stoke Manfield. Um, and um, I viewed it, and it, it, everything was fine. Everything was accessible. We, we thought we might have to take the kitchen door off um, for access. Um, but when I actually got released from Stoke Mandeville, I was in an action-free uh, manual chair, which is horrible, monstrosity of a, of a wheelchair. And um, I, I actually found that I couldn't access the flat as well as I could originally. Um, and because of that, um, I'd have to kind of like take my feet off my footrest to get into to, to, to the bathroom or anything like that. Kind of made like the first kind of, yeah, two, three months. Uh, yeah, kind of not great. But after that, um, yeah, the, having a chair that was suitable for my needs. Um, after that, then, yeah, the renting came a little bit easier. Um, and it just kind of took anything which was kind of, yeah, newish, really. I don't really get that kind of luxury. I just kind of like anything at the time, which I feel is kind of a new build and meets the regulations, then I can just kind of, yeah, squeeze into it, I guess. Can, can I ask, have you uh, considered or looked at going down any routes like dis um, Disabled Facilities Grant or getting um, any changes made? Uh, well, obviously, because I don't, I don't know how that works with me, because obviously it's, 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 it would have to do some, I would have to speak to a landlord or something like that, I guess. Um, for them to give permission for that um, so I haven't looked into those options um, I'm kind of unaware that if where I stand with them as a private a private renter um, yeah yeah um, either Gary or um, Guy can you tell us a bit more about a DFG and I'm aware that we've got um, people following from various different places, um, including, I think is Mila, I think from Germany, we need to say hello to, so there's people looking from all over the world. So there'll be uh, different regulations depending where you live. But um, if maybe just briefly, Gary, you could go into what a DFG is or, or Guy Wanaku, um, and then we'll yeah. wrap this section up in a little while. Disabled Facilities Grant is um, to pay for uh, various adaptions to a property for disabled needs. Um, access ramp wet room widening doorways um improve, improving the heating um but there are restrictions um the maximum amount is different in england wales in england it's thirty thousand, possibly i think 36 in wales um and it and it's and it doesn't exist in scotland they uh, presumably have something different uh in scotland um there's also a limitation on how much they'll give you depending on your on your savings so if you have savings above six thousand pounds then that will that will be taken into account unless the the grant is for uh, a ch child under the age of 18 then the savings won't be taken into account um and it, the amount you will get and, and the process varies from local authority to local authority um so there is no set formula really um, um for jack's situation it does it is, um, it is available to landlords for a disabled uh, tenant. So that may be worth looking into. Um, if, you, if you're a landlord, I mean, I'm a landlord myself, and if I had a disabled tenant, I'd obviously, I'd obviously um, go down that route and um, try and get things done for them. Yeah, Just it's... briefly, Gary, or if, where, where would you go to find information about DFGs? Uh, so, no, yeah. Go no, on, sorry, Gary. No, I was just going to say your local, your, your local council and local uh, authority. Um, I might know some more. Well, uh, I was going to say, so there's a couple of places you can go. Uh, you can go direct. Um, like it is a process and, and there are certain things that it's worth knowing. So the first thing in terms of those, uh, how much is available? Um, the, each, each local authority may have discretionary funds available. And so depending on the work that needs doing, there may be a possibility to, to top that up. Um, but that again, just as Gary said, is a postcode lottery. Um, the other thing, I think on, on each person or each, each property, it's a one-time uh, grant. So if, if you're going in thinking, I, I just need the kitchen done, I'll get the bathroom done later, you actually need to make sure that you're properly assessed on on all your needs around the property and um 
the occupational therapist or the assessor should should help you through that. Um, there are um, home improvement agencies, and they they work with um, the tenant or the homeowner uh, to to lead you through the process. So you shouldn't be, shouldn't have difficulty doing that. I think the it's find my HIA home improvement agency find my uk is a starting point. Um, and if you're getting no joy there, um, there is a, a government funded agency called foundations and they, they don't really work with the, with the kind of the occupant or the, the resident. They tend to work with um, uh, councils and, and home improvement agencies. But if you're getting stuck, then they'll have area representatives who can point you in the right directions because they know the system inside out. Um, and you know the, the people I know passionately believe in in making it work like the funds are there they are designed to keep people in their homes which at the end of the day saves the taxpayer money uh you know if your home works for you so um it is based on the occupant and and not the the owner uh it's so in Jack's case that that should be uh or could be an avenue to explore okay well so we've got people um when regarding the housing sort of uh, mentioning on the um comments some of their favorite items that they have as home improvements or adaptions are automatic door opener, um, widened front door and ramps, and Google Chromecast, um, which is very useful. So I'm going to go around everyone very quickly and just give a 30 seconds of what your favorite adaption to your own housing situation accommodation is and why. So um, uh, Emma, let's go with you first. Yeah, probably my my electric door opener as well. I think is my favourite because it's just like a button. So I've got one clipped on my wheelchair and one clipped on my handbag, and I can literally answer the door myself to the postman and deliveries. And then when I come home, I can let myself in and that. So that's kind of the greatest sort of tool I've got. I think. Thank you, uh, Duncan. I think the profile in bed. I mean, having a good bed um, and sit up and down and uh, raise the height so that you don't get bad back. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's probably the best thing we have, I think. Uh, Jack? Um, currently using a, a potato uh, smasher to um, open my uh, kitchen window with. Uh, I thought that was quite <laughs> handy. A high-tech version. <laughs> yeah. OK, okay Gary? Um, I've got a set of French doors with with a level threshold that go from my uh, kitchen out into a patio. And um, just being able to just roll in and out there, especially in the summer, when we had these lovely summer mornings and um, have breakfast outside with my, with my wife and my daughter um, is lovely. And also that connection with the, with the outside and uh, the natural light I get through there, although it's not entirely an adaption, but it, um, the level access element does allow me to make full use of it. And also, uh, on, a, on the same lines as Jack, I've got um, I've got some grabbers that are used to turn over pork chops, which I use to get cereal boxes out of the cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> and Guy? Love that. Uh, so I, I guess the two things uh, in my home, one is the accessible kitchen. So we, um, we, we were lucky enough, we built uh, our own house. And at the end, we were running out of money. So having looked at all the fancy kitchens, we ended up going for a, a freestanding kitchen. So just buying bits and pieces. But I got stainless steel, commercial stainless steel um, uh, sort of tables. And, and, and also uh, off eBay, I got an old sink, commercial sink, which I chopped out uh, the middle of the sink in order that it wasn't so deep and I get my feet under and then re-welded it together. And the, just every time I go somewhere else and offer to wash up and realize I'm back to washing up sideways, um, I just, I love that sink. Uh, but I guess also I, I have a, I bought a stand sit um, desk off eBay and I've got a, an Oswald Street standing frame so I can, I can work standing up uh, or sitting down and, and just that, that ability to stand and, and stretch out all my muscles every day uh, makes a huge difference. Um, I think a lot of people are saying that their kind of tech adaptions on the comments are, are very popular with them. So you can sort of speak your Alexas and um, Google and all that sort of thing so that they can just make, you know, orders and online stuff very much easier. Um, mm -hmm. I think for me personally, um, it's my electric garage door opener because that's 
my access in and out of the house and I go in and out there regular times. Um, that's, you know, and I can go straight and put things straight in my car. So that's, that's really useful for me. Um, I think what we're going to do now is call the sort of section to a close. So we're, we've spoken earlier about who can do R. We've got a little video now that hopefully Ben will be ready to play for us. Um, I'm going to remind everyone that if you've got questions um, to put them in the comments or any comments you've got, also, there is going to be a poll or a short survey, which is also on the uh, Can Do Facebook page that will be put up um, either it is already or it will be by the end of this session. So um, if you've got any comments, then put them in there as well. It's just a quick survey. And um, we'll play the uh, kind of uh, the video about what Can Do Group is as a whole. And we'll be back with you for the second half in a bit. from the video now so that's a little bit about who is in can do and what we do um so we haven't talked much about uh, the current situation we're in which is the covid situation so maybe we can bring that a bit more into this so it's affecting us all quite severely also, uh, certainly in the uk and probably most areas of the, the world as well um, but this second section is going to be more about um 
kind of how we access our, our kind of socializing and moving around in our own homes. Um, what piece of equipment do we use? What's important to us um, to help our physical and mental health and just how getting the right equipment can really um, make the difference between ease of using our, our home for a, you know all the things that we want to do and the frustration of not being able to do that. Um, so uh, any anyone want to start? I think Jack, particularly you are uh, our resident mechanic for wheelchair parts mm. and uh, uh, making sure mm. everyone's equipment is running smoothly. So do you want to start about the importance of, of uh, our mobility equipment? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, this, this all comes down to the, the, being in the right chair to get around the house. Um, so, I mean, like I said to you uh, earlier, um, when I was in an action free, it just it didn't work for for the environment I was in. Um, and when I got my first kind of active user chair, um, I kind of noticed that it did all of the work for me for that. So like getting over, so none of my thresholds getting into the flat our level so there's you, you kind of have to I have, i've had to use kind of my skills and uh, and the chair to kind of navigate through those um but um but yeah ultimately it's, it's, it's i think it comes down to being sat in a good chair as a, as a good base point um is this is always a good start that answers your not, not everyone will be wheelchair users who are watching this so that is going to be different for different people some people will be power chair mm -hmm. users some people will of other mobility limitations or other disabilities, but um, particularly with today, we're, we're, we're talking about, well, mainly about wheelchair access. Um, but uh, anyone else want to, to comment on, on the importance of it, getting it right and how it's affected there? Uh, well, can I mention kind of the visual side of it? Because I find it's the visual access I struggle with more because I'm registered blind as well. Yeah. I heavily rely on a lot of access for that, so. <laughs> Like, I mean, I kind of rely heavily on technology like my iPhone, iPad and laptop to make sure I have the right software for it. And then it's things like being able to access certain apps to make sure the app is compatible with the voiceover or the audio description or whatever it needs to be to be able to see that. But without those access needs, you know, you could miss out on certain things, whether it's watching films or TV programmes or accessing a particular meeting or social, social event online and things like that so I find that's really important yeah I think I think um the uh, I can't remember it was Jack saying just the, the importance of the physical space and and, and how it works uh, so you know I'm uh, a wheelchair user you know but paraplegic so I'm I'm pretty independent um but for me it's about keeping keeping space getting rid of things i'm not using or, or don't need and and you can probably see behind me i've got one or two bits of exercise equipment and i've got an active passive exercise bike um and it's just keeping that that structure and that routine uh between keeping my body moving and and trying to maintain my health uh but also having the, the you know the, the somewhere for this equipment um and i think harking back to last week um we were we were looking at um uh, you know, exercising, and and next week I know we've got various bits of equipment. But the thing that makes the the most enormous difference for me, I've got a mountain trike, and we're uh, you know we've got some amazing walks just just near us. So, you know, as a family and and the dog, uh, it's just getting out regularly and remembering to connect with outdoors and 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 have that space so that there's you know the the world gets bigger rather than feeling smaller because we're all spending so much time in our homes. We, we actually bought a gazebo this year and we've been using that quite a lot as the weather's uh, become a little bit cooler and kind of been able to um, sit with um, relatives, you know, at a safe distance. Outside is a lot safer with a lot more air circulation because uh, we've been shielding. So we've actually found that's been a real uh, bonus, um, you know, through the two lockdowns really and, and just recently having takeaway meals sort of outside all in our coats and things. It's been quite fun, really. The classic, the classic problem solving that we spend our entire lives doing and which makes us so suited for work, frankly. Yeah, we, as a, as a family, when the weather was, was much better than it is now, um, made a lot 
a lot more use of our, our garden space than, than, than we ever did before. And some days we had all three meals, breakfast to lunch and dinner out in the garden. They've had so many barbecues. Um, and that was partly necessity and partly taking the opportunity um, that there are, and as it has turned out to be the odd little silver lining to COVID, although it'd be very small, um, people being able to get out and appreciate the, the, their outside space, those, those that do have a, are fortunate enough to have their own garden or get out. I've, um, I've got a little dog and um, I try when, I, when, I, when I've got time to get out, take the dog for a walk. Um, and I use, I use something called a free wheel. And for, for years, um, I'd, I'd walk the dog without using this bit of kit. And I'd spend a majority of my time walking, uh, going on the walk, pushing, um, looking at the ground, making sure on the front casters I'm going to get caught on a stone or a little divot in the ground. Because um, I have I had the chair tip up um, on the odd occasion in the past, but with um, free wheel, which is a which is a larger single wheel that just clips on the front of your wheelchair, it means I don't have to do that any longer because the chair will just bounce over anything because it's on, on the path, so I can I can look up, look around, um, and feel more connected uh, with the outside. Yeah, I think we can all, uh, well, many of us can identify with that. Um looking down at the ground to make sure you're not about to run into a big stone or something, <laughs> um, situation. Um, yeah, I think I would say um, my house has, has been different over the years because um, when I first came out of hospital, I was, I'm incomplete. So I was trying to use my crutches as much as possible. Uh, and um, to begin with, I wanted houses where I could um, maybe use one crutch or just walk using the, the walls and the furniture to help me get around. So, I wanted things where I had essentially corridors or things that I could lean on to get around places, which is completely different from now where I'm using my wheelchair fully um, around the house and pretty much all the time. So you want open spaces. So, you know, it's a very, very different situation. Um, regarding bits of equipment, I really like to do, um, go out on my handbike and Gary and myself uh, both know each other from wheelchair racing. So we've got um, wheelchair racing chairs and we also, um, do a lot on, on Zoom calls um, with our racing group, to, which is really good for our physical and mental health, I think. Um, you guys you guys competing against each other? We are actually very close. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are, we're quite competitive, actually. Um, when In the days when we could actually go and do races, then we would we'd be about 50-50 in the last, last couple of years, about who's won. So, um, Excellent. Yeah. Good, good sparring partners. Day. Again. Quite a few half marathons, but it's in a few seconds between us. Yeah, yeah. And Jack, do you find that you have lots of people um, needing, you know, kind of modifications and, and repairs to their uh, bits of equipment, their clip-on bikes and um, hand bikes and that kind of thing? Yeah, no, that's, um, I think there's, there's been a big kind of boost of that because of uh, the lockdown and stuff where people are using various bits of equipment and yeah so there, there has been a, an increase in that um personally for myself i have to say uh we've locked down uh, especially when we were allowed to kind of come out and do some exercise um i was using uh using my basketball chair and it was quite a, a, a nice uh, experience because i didn't use kind of the uh, the outdoor courts um to their full advantage but finding a nice outdoor court and doing that that was uh yeah that was good um yeah yeah, um, and uh, Duncan, I think some we were talking a bit earlier that um, not all the uh, kind of bits of equipment, the additional stuff that we have around our house work. And you were, you were telling us about um, your hydro pool that you had for a while. Yeah, well, it was a hot tub, really. Um, and it was outside um, when the boys were young. My, my son, one of my sons has Dravet syndrome, so he's got um, a movement disorder so it was really good for him to be able to stretch out and sort of enjoy the water it was great when they were little because I could just lift them in and also my wife Claire can lift them at that time but um, as we've got a bit older it's a little bit more tricky and it is quite difficult to get a hoist um, near enough to the edge you know you can't there's, n there's no space underneath it to put um, to put the hoist so uh, we did get rid of it in the end so it's Quite pricey trying to heat um, a hot tub outside as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it was fun while it lasted. And we will come back to the more things on the equipment because uh, Jack will have his video towards the end um, showing how to keep things maintained when it comes to your, um, your day chair, if that's relevant to you. We're just going to go on to our last question, um, which is more about sort of socialising uh, and things that we can do for, to maintain social contacts within our home, uh, protect our mental health and, and what we do to, um, to do this mostly. Does anyone want to start? Um, <clears throat> I've got a, an app on my phone called Headspace and uh, I do I know, a mindful meditation every morning. I've been doing mindful meditation for quite some years, but it wasn't, it wasn't until I got the app that it then became a, a more definite daily practice that I would, I would do at least once a day um, before I had the intention to do it each day, but it probably don't either. It's three or four times a, a week. And I have, I have found that it does help with my, um, my mental health. It has helped me uh, help with my stress levels. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd recommend that to anybody, especially if anybody was uh, has never tried mindful meditation. The app's quite useful in the respect that you can get a, uh, a 30 day free trial and then if, and over that 30 days, it will take you through from beginner through to um, through the whole process of what the meditation is and, and different types of uh, practices. Yeah, I think looking after uh, mental health is just it's so important, and and I I I I'm pleased to see kind of the environment around mental health is is actually changing and people are are beginning to understand like what it can look like not to be okay and whether that's um, you know behavior you know our behaviors with with family or whatever for for me um, you know part of my own. Uh, looking, looking at my past, and and you know, dealing with with what things I find difficult. So we're really lucky. I've got a slightly alternative um, therapist who I see when I need uh, over the last two years, and and uh, it's really been transformational. So it's it's that fascinating kind of introspective look at what's coming up and and you know what's being triggered uh, to to you know create or block certain behaviours. Um, but uh, I think I, I know that uh, some of you guys here are, are gamers and stuff and, and look to other people. Funny enough, this year, I think with COVID and everything and, and lockdown, we've been, uh, we've been kind of quite a family unit. So I've got two small kids um, and, and we've, you know, we've spent some amazing quality time together, which, um, as I think you said earlier, uh, Gary, you know, it's a silver lining. Yeah, but we, we've all been shielding him. So my other son, Victor, he's not been able to really see his friends. So it's been really uh, good for him to be able to get, you know, go on the PlayStation and connect with all his school friends and play games together and chat, chat to them. Uh, the technology that they've got to stay connected to them, even though they can't meet. Um, and that has been uh, amazing for him, I think. And, um, Jack, you've been doing gaming as well, is that right? Yeah, no, I've been uh, abusing uh, 12 year olds on Call of Duty most of the time online, doing all of that kind of gaming stuff. So, um, yeah, I have to say there was a gaming side of things, and all of that has kind of kept me kind of, yeah, a lot, a lot mentally more like sane, just kind of having that relief actually. Uh, yeah, during the kind of early lockdown period, uh, yeah, that helped a lot. So, yeah, that was good. Are you Good. living by yourself, Jack? I am, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a completely different experience. I, like, you know, from, from, uh, from me, say, like, how has that been? Because that's a much more grueling um, it's situation. Really, it's been really difficult. Um, I'd, I'd have to say work's probably been the kind of main, my main outlet, that, and then coming home and just kind of like, yeah, like I said, doing the, 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 the gaming or being able to get a bit of time out on court or something like that just to, to get out of that but um yeah no it's, it's been very difficult yeah do you have people local to you that you know within uh, within within the guidelines and the rules you can uh, actually meet outside uh well my parents live in spain so no um and then apart from that about an hour and a half drive to, to my to my to my sisters um okay. so this it's been a it's been a difficult one 
Uh, I think there's a lot of people that probably share the same sort of situation um, in these COVID times. Um, feeling, well, kind of feeling like they're isolated before and then ultimately isolate, isolating again and then just kind of feeling like, well, it's, it's, it's just kind of a little bit of a breeze, to be honest. Yeah. So, so how do you, like, how do you view like gaming or, or sort of online stuff? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. That's, that's a massive, that's been a massive kind of relief, um, you know, where you, you, you chat to friends for, for an hour on, 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 a, on a game or something like that. Um, yeah, no, it's, 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 yeah, it's been really helpful, that kind of stuff. And, and in terms of the gaming, have you had any, uh, like, I don't game, so I don't, I, I don't really know it, but are you gaming uh, sort of in a mainstream way or is there convention, are there kind of adaptive uh, tools or technology which which change anything uh, for you? My hand functions um, is, is is good, so I'm using just a standard controller. Um, like for but there are there's there's this adapt, adapt equipment out there um, for for gamers who, who have bad dexterity or something like that. Um, but yeah, no, at the moment I'm just using kind of a standard controller or just a standard X- Xbox platform. I think there's a charity um, special effect that they, they can do an assessment if you, if you uh, need you know, specialist equipment. Um, and uh, there's lots of um, amazing um, adaptive controllers out there. Things where you can, or games being adapted, so you can just use one, one button. And there's a website called One, one Switch dot uh, org where uh, there's games on there which you know, actually just press one button uh, so there are things to if people want to give it a try you had quite a good publicity for travis Act recently didn't you through was it xbox yeah uh, we did um zach anna is a comedian yeah, in, that, uh, he? yeah. in the usa and he used uh travis Act in the microsoft video um, when they brought out the um Xbox adaptive controller, which is a new um, interface where you can plug in different switches and joysticks and puff switches um, to you know work the Xbox. So, and he used it in the video. I tried to set to mount uh, some of the joysticks and switches he was using. So it's been seen by millions of people, but they probably didn't know it was Travis Sack. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was good. And Emma, what, what's your experience of kind of social media forums and... Um... Well, I've been really lucky this year, actually, because I think my workload's kind of increased a lot because of it. Because before, like, a lot of, like, because I've been doing a lot of online courses for, like, freelance journalists and things. But normally these courses, you'd have to sort of travel to, like, London or Manchester or something to do it, which is normally quite more difficult for me because I need to rely on carers to accompany me and the travel time and everything. But now being able to do it over Zoom or online forums, it's just so much easier because you just book it there and then turn up on the day and you're ready to go. So I managed to achieve so much more sort of learning and also getting work as well and doing a lot more work. Because also with my work at Disability Horizons, trying to organise interviews can be quite difficult because a lot of these people are busy away filming or recording or you know, competing in sport and things like that. Now with everything not, it's not really happening at the moment, we're able to get hold of these people more frequently. So I managed to do a lot more interviews this year than I have any other year this year. So overall, really, I think COVID's been pretty good for me this year, really, in terms of my career, I think. I think the only thing I'm missing is really just seeing my friends face-to-face and going to gigs and festivals, really. It's the only thing I'm missing at the moment. Yeah, COVID has definitely leveled the playing field to to a degree in in the work uh, situation. Uh, and I was speaking to uh, a colleague who who she talks about neurodiversity and and how you know for for her and and a number of her clients uh, that's made a that's made a huge difference. And they're really pushing to kind of keep the home home working ethos uh, uh, out the other end of this. Yeah, I think it's really a leveler. As part of my profession, I have to do continual personal development. Um, and I, I've also found that that all of these courses, that I, I may have had to travel some distance or they were just too far away or they were limited by numbers, that they're all online on Zoom. And I'm, I'm doing more than ever. Keep myself up to date with um, changing technologies and products, uh, regulations, etc. Mm. 
it should help with employment opportunities because now people realise it can be done. You know, you can work from home. You don't have to travel to London to sit in an office to work. Um, you can you can work from home effectively. So it should lead to more opportunities, really. For disabled people who are of their own home, uh, it's absolutely suitable for them and not have to spend two hours on a train and then try and get through London or whatever. Yeah, I'd say um, it, it's a it's a nice continuation of that BBC journalist uh, having his kid run into the room during the interview that everyone absolutely adored. Uh, just yeah, completely. It's very human, very accepting. Yeah, and I think that's a good way for it to go forward as well. You know, we are all individuals in different situations, and uh, being accepting of that is a really good way to go. And it has levelled up the, the the playing field for a lot for people with disabilities. I think. I'm going to try and draw this bit to a close now, so I'm a bit aware of the time. Um, so we have got a video uh, from Jack with some uh, wheelchair maintenance and tips on. So it's about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, we're going to come back after that. If you've got any questions, then get them onto the comments in the uh, Can Do Facebook page. Um, so I think the uh, questionnaire is now up the survey. So also feel free to go on and uh, put your answers into that. Um, and we will be back in a little while um, and we'll finish any questions that you've got, wrap things up and tell you about next week. Okay, are you ready to go with the video? Hi guys, it's Jack from JMS. Today I'm going to be showing you a video on how to keep in your wheelchair well maintained. We'll be going over the bare necessities like changing tyres, adjusting quick release bins, checking and tightening fixings and also chair hygiene which is really important during a pandemic and key to keeping parts working. I hope you find it useful, enjoy. Taking off the tire. So, I'm removing the tire because it's bald and um, it's showing the Kevlar lining. Um, so this has got um, a Presta valve, which is a high pressure inner tube, allows you to hold higher pressures. Um, so I've unscrewed the cap here. Um, if you've got a car valve or a shrouder valve, um, you want to kind of use like a, a smaller Allen key just to push the uh, the valve core in. So on this one, I'll screw, unscrew the cap off the top. I'm going to release the air like so. I want to make sure that you deflate the inner tube uh, completely. And then if you just kind of work around, just making sure the tire is off of the the bead of the wheel or the. And then after that, I start opposite the valve. Um, then you put less strain through the through the inner tube, and you're not going to break the valve or anything like that. So I'm using the metal the metal uh, tire levers. And I just start in opposite the valve. I'm taking really small chunks. That's not meant to happen. We can improvise on that, but it's on my massive feet. Oh, we get that. So we're just taking little bites, just kind of feeding the tire over the wheel. We just want to get the first initial part off. Just enough so then we can just do it by hand, like so. So then after that, I'm going to. Remove the tie with my hands and I swing. work that round to the valve like so and then get the tube out starting opposite the valve again if you just peel the tire over you might need to use tire levers to do that Right, so that's that all off. Yeah. So now we've got a tire in the tube off. This would be the best time to check over the the hand room fixings um, and also the the spoke tension. So um, you you'll need to remove the rim tape um, and replace that. Um, unless you've got the kind of uh, plastic all in one piece, then you'll just remove that like a tire. Um, and this would be the time where you would. You would tighten up those hammer and fixings. You generally tell if there's a if you've got a loose fixing um, on the on the hand rooms. But if you give you the rim a tap like that, you'll get like a, 
a tinny vibrating noise that will come back and feed through there um, and then you want to replace those um, if it is the if you do have the the wheels that hold have like um, a nylon a, a nylon um, uh, nut on the, uh, the the outside um, if they are if they if they have worn loose then it's probably best that you replace those fixings um, and then what, checking the spokes so you just want to kind of go around and in between your hands just kind of have a feel of the tension and if there's if there's any that kind of are obviously loose then I would just tighten them up half a turn just to kind of match the the, the tension of the other spokes realistically that needs to be trued in a truing stand um, and that can be done at any kind of good uh, good independent kind of uh, bike 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 store really um, because a wheel is kind of balanced uh, through every spoke um, so every every spoke is individually individually has its own tension to, to create that wheel to spin straight um, and yeah so if you've got a wheel which has kind of multiple spokes that are loose um, I would tighten them up just to keep the wheel rolling but like I said um, realistically um, that would need to be trued properly to get that wheel to spin straight again so now I'll put the new tyre on so I'm putting a Marathon Plus tyre on um, as you can see the tread it's all brand new um, so that's going to help uh, in in the winter, um, especially in the wet conditions, so when I put the brakes on to do the transfers and stuff like that. Um, uh, so what we're going to do to start off with, so I'm just going to put the feed, the first bead of the uh, the tyre on to the rim, and then I'm just going to work round, just get the first lip of the tyre on. Like so, you might need to use tyre levers. Um, they generally kind of squeeze on with by hand. So I'm. Using the old inner tube, I'm confident that it's been holding pressure. Um, if they do, if you do find that when you're taking off the tyre and your inner tube is stuck to the rim tape or to the tyre, it generally happens with the uh, with, with with inner tubes and tyres that have been on the wheelchair for a long time and they've, they've gone through kind of changes of temperature through summer and stuff like that, and they end up sticking um, to the lining of the uh, to the, of the tyre or the actual rim tape then I would, I would swap that out, especially if you're having to kind of really peel it away from um, from from the tyre or the rim. Because, uh, yeah, you'll fill it and then you'll generally find that it will leak later on. I mean, you, you can chance it, but it's just not really worth the hassle um, for it. Um, right, so I'm putting this back in. So I'm just peeling, just peeling, just, I don't, you can't really see that, but I'm just, where the valve is, where it slots in, I'm just moving the tyre over, um, bringing that bead, the bead over to expose the hole, feed that through. You want to have the tyre slightly, inf no, sorry, the inner tube slightly inflated. Um, that will um, that will help to prevent any pinching when fitting the tyre. And then I just go around, feed that into the the well of the, the, the wheel, like so, all the way around. Like that. Uh, and then starting at the valve this time, so I just start a little bit past it, um, and I feed it in with my hands, the bead of the tire. And as I go past the valve, I just make sure that that pushes up into the tyre um, and that will make sure that the, the, the tyre is seated properly around the valve so when you inflate it, it won't come over, it won't come, it won't, the lip of the tyre won't pop over off the, off the wheel, sorry. Um, right, so I'm just feeding it around with my hands, just making sure that that's all seated. You might find with some of them, um, especially the 24s, then you can fit them by hand. Um, I'm not far off from doing it with this 25 inch wheel. Just get as much as the tyre on and then I'll use the levers. So I'm obviously uh, using my long legs as a, as a workbench, um, which if you know me, you'll see me do this quite often. Uh, but yeah, and then what I'm doing is starting um, so I've just I've used the, the lever over here 
um, just to get the, the my first lever just to get the tire over and then working at the opposite end of the the tire where it's still kind of exposed and just doing small bites being very careful not to pinch that inner tube and just working it over if you see that you kind of um, the inner tube if you see the inner tube kind of bunching up then I would go back and start again because you're probably likely to have pinched the tight I mean the inner tube so there you go just working around slow small bites and then the last bit you just feed over with your hand like so now that's ready to be inflated um, yeah so I'll pump that up most um most uh, wheelchair um, tires that inflate to the well I mean a good kind of average that'd be about like 80 psi um, so this one um, they all have they're all marked up with what the pressures will take so on this marathon it has a minimum of 85 and a maximum of 145 psi um, I'll run this uh, with my compressors on the floor down there I'll run that at about 110 psi um, it's a good kind of happy medium um, and yeah that'll keep me rolling really smoothly so I'll inflate that and then I'll pop that back on and that's that done. Quick release pins. So I'm going to teach you how to adjust them. First of all, I'm just going to show you what it looks like to have play in the quick release pin. So on this side, as you can see, that's all locked into place. There's no movement there at all. And as we come across to this side, loads of play in that. And I'm going to show you how to reduce that play. So, adjusting the quick release pin. I'm going to remove the pin completely from the hub of the wheel. Um, commonly with most, uh, most axle pins, um, it will be a 19mm adjustment spanner on the larger end and on the shorter end it's going to be 11mm. Um, and then to, so to reduce the play, I'm going to want to, I want to reduce this length of the pin here by tightening this onto the axle. And if the pin's not locking into place, then I'm going to want to slacken that off to allow that length to grow, to allow the pin to slot in. Um, you don't want to go crazy with the, with, with, with the adjustments, so just do small quarter turns to start off with, in or out, um, depending on if you're lengthening or shortening the quick release pin. Um, and then just place that back into the wheel, back onto the uh, camera bar of the wheelchair, and then just make sure you're happy with that and that there's no play and it's locking into play securely. Bearing maintenance. Simple principles to them is the cleaner you keep them, the longer they're gonna last. So these ones don't have any hair around them, but they have been exposed to the elements, which has stripped all the lubricant from the seal under there, and it's just left them bone dry and they sound like this. So that's not causing um, me much resistance, but what it is doing is it's giving me this lateral play. Um, that is a sign that the bearing starting to fail. It doesn't matter if I try to tighten the two bolts on the outside to reduce that play. It's just a case that the, 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 the ball bearings and all of the casings on the inside are worn and they're starting to fail. And over time, that will then leave the casing and everything to break. And this bearing will fail, which will be... Well, yeah, not great, and it will leave the chair not rolling at all. Um, so I swapped out the other side. I'm going to show you what they so look like. So I swapped out the bearings on this caster. Um, there's no more lateral movement on them. They're nice and firm, and when I spin them, there's no noise. This is the case with all of the bearings on a chair. So um, your pot bearings that are integrated into the frame, or if it's uh, a fork bearing which will be integrated into the fork, um, depending on the manufacturer of the chair. Um, if you get any kind of uh, resistance when they're trying to pivot left or right, or if there's any back and forth movement, that's kind of a sign that they're, they're starting to fail and they need replacing. Um, so, cleaning, so cleaning in between this gap here with just kind of like a, um, any sort of uh, wet wipe or antibacterial wipe, something like that. Um, it's going to remove any of the dirt, debris and just keep that bearing nice and clean. Um, same again with the with the caster bearings. So, if you if you can't if you haven't got the confidence to to remove uh, the axle, 
um, to take the caster off to clean them, um, then I recommend you kind of you pick at the pick at the hair with some tweezers or uh, anything like that, just to remove the uh, the the excess hair, which is going to give them a, a a better fighting chance. Chair hygiene um, it's really important to keeping your chair clean, especially during a pandemic. Um, so I would use either some antibacterial wipes, or if you want to be a little bit more eco, um, spray a bit of disinfectant just onto onto a, onto an old tea towel, old rag, anything like that. Just kind of go over the hand rings, go over the quick release buttons, um, any kind of point of contact that you come into. So you touch, sorry. So like your brakes, the frame on the front. Um, just go over that. It's also a really good practice um, to keep in any kind of moving component clean. Um, it's going to prolong the life of them. So like on your brakes, um, it will just clean up the, uh, the areas where they pivot or where you see like a build up of dirt. Same again on, on your pot bearings or fork bearings just in this gap here. Um, it's a very common place to get a build up of dirt. Uh, any sort of move, moving component. So um, if your backrest folds, uh, I would, the pivot point in there, I would make sure that that's clean. It's also good if you remove the rear wheels, uh, where the quick release pin was, uh, where it is, um, just where the bearing is as well, just clean those areas up. Anywhere that you kind of get a build up of dirt around any sort of moving component. And then after you've done that, um, if you want to lubricate them to allow them to move freely, I'd use any sort of PTF lubricant um, and just just um, we just spray a little bit on any of the moving parts, um, making sure that I wipe off any excess. Um, really important to to make sure that the uh, before you spray any lubricant on anything that you make sure the surface area is clean um, because if you if you're just spraying onto dirt, you're just going to allow the dirt to kind of seep in slowly into any of those components. Or if you're not wiping away any excess, you'll just build up more dirt around that area um, and then you're just going to cause more damage. Wait, tell me when. Okay, hopefully that found you found that really useful on keeping uh, your wheelchair in Perfectly good working order. Um, and Jack is obviously available um, if you have any issues and he will come out in his adapted van to come and fix all your problems. Or hopefully anyway, <laughs> hopefully he's here. he'll have all the tools for the job. Uh, so we've got a few questions that we just want to go through before um, we wrap things up. So Andrea has asked about any um, approved wheelchair suppliers. Um, we do actually have one in the Candy group. They are spokes.co.uk. Um, Jack, have you got any comments on them or another ones that we can that we can use? Yeah, so depending on on what what avenue you choose to go down. So if you're if you're if you're going through the NHS, then obviously you would go to your your local wheelchair uh, service services. Um, but other than that, it's more of just uh, who you 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 work with and who you kind of who you find as a reliable kind of uh, wheelchair manufacturer. So. Uh, Everyone, it's all preference really after that um, on what you want to use and who you want to work with. And you could probably also go to some of the online forums uh, in the UK, particularly ones like um, SCI Owners Club are quite active uh, if you want to get opinions of what people think of various different suppliers. So um, that's a good way of finding out um, who people think are good. I'm going to go around a few people now and just ask them um, because they've got particular areas of expertise and they're going to go and be putting some uh, links into the comments page um, on this video itself. So uh, Guy, which ones were you going to put in? Uh, so I've stuck in the one for the Find My HIA uh, Home Improvement Agency. So if you're thinking about uh, Disabled Facilities Grant, look, there's, it, is, it is a little bit regional. Some places are missing, but there, there is help for you. It, it can be a uh, a bit of an ordeal or a bit of a process but there is help is, is the key message um, and I've also put in for wheelchair users wanting to rent privately um, I've put in a, a, a link for our registration page um, there's no obligation there's no cost uh, so have a look and um, Gary um, I've put in a, a link to the dis disabilities um, Disabled Facilities Grant, and that's a, uh, it's a .gov site, and it's just a very uh, basic guide. 
Okay, Duncan? I'll put the links for um, special effect charity you can get in contact with who are experts in gaming and um, finding the right controllers or games for you to enjoy, enjoy games. And also for one switch who um, specialises in um, games that can be played with one on switch and retro gaming. And also Graham Law, who is an engineer, and he creates um, amazing, these sophisticated controllers. Um, he's based in Leicestershire, and he also has worked for Remap for many years. So he's a real problem solver and a great person to chat to if you've got a particular um, need, really, for, for using controllers. And I think um, you're also going to put in the link for the Xbox oh, yeah. adaptive controller, which, yeah, sure. if you don't know about it, is a really good bit of kit. can be a, attached to your Xbox, so you can plug in loads of different um, switch options and control options um, if you have issues with hand function or anything else. And Emma? Um, I'd just like to share my blog, Rock for Disability, as it's got content about living with cerebral palsy and being registered blind and vice pieces. And it's also got links to my Disability Horizons content and other freelance journalism content that you're welcome to read and share. Well, thank you for joining us, everyone, for this week's um, event. So we, you'll be able to watch this later. It will be up on our Candy Facebook page um, not long after we've uh, finished this actually segment. So hopefully Ben will be working in the background to get that up in the next uh, few hours or by tomorrow, certainly. And uh, please do go on use our survey, uh, comment in the comments if you want to. Um, and we're also going to tell you and put at the end of this a little video telling you what's going to happen next week, which is event three, the last one in the series. It's about accessing the outdoors. Uh, Guy, you're going to be actually chairing that one. So do you want to give us a quick um, rundown of who's going to be on it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, looking forward to that. I'm going to be chatting with Tim Farr from Access Adventures. So if you've been thinking about getting out and uh, Paris and um, water skiing or kite surfing um, or staying at home and doing some adaptive yoga, he's a great person to talk to. Uh, chatting to Tim Morgan uh, from Mountain Trike. Um, I, I have one. I'm a complete uh, fan of, of the Mountain Trike. It's given me my freedom. Um, there'll be a practical demonstration by Stuart or, um, Wheeler of Freedom Wheelchair Skills, so helping people get out with a bit more confidence in their wheelchairs, whether it's curb hopping or steps or anything else. And also Gemma Pierce from Loop Wheels, uh, which makes a big difference to uh, comfort and, and uh, reducing any pain people might have from bumping down uh, and, and hard riding. So it's uh, going to be a good week. So yeah, join us again next Friday, at, sorry, next uh, Tuesday at 5 p.m. And that'll be the last one in the series. And that's the, everything for us today. We'll leave you with the video um, kind of pre showing you what the next um, one's going to be like. And it's just time for us to say goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Getting into the great outdoors can have a huge impact on our mental and physical well-being. This week on Can Do Live, Mountain Trike, Access Adventures, Loop Wheels and Freedom Wheelchair Skills talk to you about how you can access the great outdoors and the adventures you can have while you're out there.